Good morning, everyone. This is Brother Dow from Fleming Island, Florida. I want to greet uh, you today in the lovely name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We're just uh, thanking Him and uh, so very much that He has chosen us before the foundation of the world. That we should be holy <clears throat> we should be holy and without blame before him and that's that's the way it's going to be uh, it don't care what what the devil says it, it don't make any difference what the world says or what, what this one says it has nothing to do with it he has already declared us uh, his Put it like this: He has already declared us His property, and uh, it's it said in there, no, "No man can pluck them from my hand." So we are safe and secure uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ. He saved each and every one of us uh, for a purpose, and uh, I don't think there's anything this. It's going to undo God's purpose because He is omnipotent. I mean, He's all power. If, if, if He's got a purpose in your life, if He has to move heaven and earth, uh, He can do it because He is omnipotent. And so since He's omniscient, knows all things, uh, He knows, he knows every, every path that's coming along. He knows ever stumble he knows everything so and he knows that no doubt we're going to stumble but uh, with the stumble he's got a way to pick you back up again i was thinking about jonah the other day god told him to go to nineveh well, and when he told him he knew he was not going to go because he knew all things so, well, why did he tell him? He said, okay, he's going to Nineveh, but he just don't know exactly how he's going, and he don't want to go over there because he's a Jew, and that bunch of renegade Gentiles over there, he's afraid they'll cut his head off. So he's going to take a, another way. He's going to take the ship to Tarshish. Well, you know the story. He gets on the ship, and all of a sudden there's a storm comes up, and oh, it's about to sink the ship, and... Noah being a just man, he said, he said, it's me, I'm the trouble. And they, they bind him all up, throw him overboard, and here comes this special built fish, comes along, picks him up, and he stays in that fish almost three days and nights, and all of a sudden that fish is headed to Nineveh. And that fish gets over there and pulls up on the shore, that great big fish, because over there, they worship the fish god, Dagon. So that fish pulls up and rolls out the game plate, and here comes who but walk out Jonah. And they said, oh my, God has sent his prophet over here. And so Jonah preaches, and the whole place repents. I mean, they've got everybody in sackcloth and ashes, even the animals. So God knows how to do it. So if there's a purpose in your life, don't worry, it's going to be done. And God knows sometimes that, well, you know, uh, God said this, but, you know, is that really, really, really? Well, don't worry. If he's, if he's called you and you're going to go, you're going to go. You might not know how you're going to go, but you will go. Boy, oh, ain't God good to give us so many blessings to take care of our lives from, from the day that we come in this world and, and cry out until the day that we live. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you today. We thank you, Lord, that you know the, the end and you know the beginning, Lord. And you know everything in between. When we go out to the cemetery, we, we see that, that on the marker it says they were born this day and they 
passed, passed away this day, but in the middle there's that little dash. And Lord, you know all about that little dash. You knew about everything that was going to happen in between there. Lord, because if they're one of yours, it was part of the plan. So Lord, there's nothing to worry about. There's nothing to fret about. Oh Lord, we as human beings, we get so we get so distraught and so everything else and wring our hands and everything. But God's got a plan and it will come to pass. And Lord, we've come to find out that we are part of the plan, Lord. You're using us this day as you've always used man on, on the face of the earth. And Lord, it will be done. So Lord, we say, let thy will be done. And we'll give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I want to take a little subject today uh, and to give this a title, I'm going to call it After Church Ages Rest. After Church Ages Rest. And so, we're going to go through this and uh, after you work, you rest. Well, in the beginning, God created all this here, and on the seventh day, He rested. And He just rested. And there's, there's only one rest that <laughs> anything else is a temple rest. But when you get in Christ, that is the rest. Because when you get there, uh, look here, all your work is over. You can rest. And so, we're going to talk about that rest and because most people are, are waiting on a rest. Well, the people of God, the predestinated, they have entered into their rest because they have entered into Christ. He has, he has come to get them and they're safe and secure. And so, no matter what, comes or goes, what's on the news, whatever it is, we're, we're at rest because we know that he's in control. And uh, I made this statement the other day and I wanted to, thought it'd be a good time maybe to bring it here. And it goes like this. God does things in a way because you know his ways are not our ways. God does things in a way that you can't understand. Well, why would he do that? If he does something that we can't understand, why does he do that? So he can, so that we can only accept it by faith. And that's where, that's where the problem comes today. He does things in such a way that we can't understand, that we can only accept it by faith. And faith is a revelation, and the revelation comes from him, not from something you thought up or somebody else told you. No, it's, it's a direct uh, link between you and him. So, and when he does it where they can't understand, boy, boy, it goes wild then because, well, they say, well, I think it's like this and I think it's like this. And so everything that they ever thought come to find out was was contrary to the word. And that's why God had a prophet come this day and then the word come to him and the word corrected all the error. Praise God. So I want to read a couple of scriptures here. Matter of fact, I'm going to read about three, but we want to start in Hebrews, uh, the fourth chapter. We're going to read verses 9, 10, and 11. Then I'm going to go to Matthew 11, 28, and then I'm going over to Revelations uh, and start in there in the first part of the church ages. Revelations 2. So if you want to read along, uh, get those places, Hebrews 4, uh, Matthew 11, and uh, Revelations chapter <clears throat> 2. So let's start here in Hebrews. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. 
For he that is entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works, as God did from his. And if you want to get the back of this, if you'll go over there and read in Hebrews 3, he's, he's talking all about how the children of Israel, when they come out, uh, they, they didn't enter into the rest because they, they, they didn't believe. But now listen to this. Cease from his work as God. And now let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. What kept them out? Speaking to the children of Israel, what kept them out? Unbelief. It's simple. Well, he said, that's, that's the example, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. So, what keeps people out of the rest today? Same thing. He give us an example. What keeps them out of the rest? Because they don't believe. They don't believe the rest is here. They don't believe Christ. Well, we just said who the rest was. The rest is Christ. Well, they don't believe Christ is here. They're waiting for Him to come. They're waiting for Him to drop out of the sky. Do this, that, or the other. Whatever the church has told them all these many, many, many years, that's what they're waiting on. Now, let's look over to Matthew eleven twenty eight, and he says, "Come unto me," and and that's that is, come unto me, and that's what the trouble is. They don't know who me is. They think me when they think when they said "Come unto me," they're thinking about a man two thousand years ago. He says, "Come unto me," and me is the word. They come unto everything else. But he's talking about, come unto me, all ye that labor. Okay, all of you that work and toll and everything else, and all of you in this shape, come unto me and are heavy laden your load. What are you loaded? What were they loaded down with? S I N. And he says, if you will come unto me, he said, I will give you rest. Not, I may give you, I will. If you'll just come unto me, Christ the Word, and you have to come under Christ the Word for your day, it won't do you any good to, to, to tell somebody, well, I believe Noah built an ark. That's good. But that's not your word. And people are believing everything else but the word for the day and the hour they live in. They can't seem to, to comprehend that. But now you know, he said, Come to all you that labor and are heavy laden. And then, you know, it's 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 people think, well, you know, I I I I'll work my way in. No, you won't. Look here. You're saved by grace through faith, not of works. You see, you mean we can't have no works? Yeah. If you're saved, you're going to have works. But you're not saved because you've got works. You're saved by what Christ has already done. you think that would be simple enough. And these people that... Come up, remember over there, in, I think it's Matthew 7, 20 something, right? And they come up and say, Lord, Lord, didn't I do this and didn't I do, didn't I have all these wonderful works? And he, what did he tell them? Depart from me, I never even knew you. So if works could save, well, it would, but it didn't save because that was not his program. But we've got workers today and people doing all these things that think they're going to get in. The gift of eternal life. It, it's a gift and you can't do one thing to merit it. It is a gift. And look here, if you got it, you've always had it. 
Because what was eternal? It never had a beginning. It never has an end. It can't die. It can't move. It, it's, it's here. Now, so grace saves us through faith. Faith is what? Revelation. Not of works. But now, listen to this. We're talking about after the church age is of rest. Now I'm going over here to Revelations chapter 2 and I'm going to start at the Ephesian age and I'm going to read a verse out of each one of these coming over from chapter 2 into chapter 3 all the way down to the Laodicean age and I want you to notice what's going on in the church ages. And we're starting with Revelations 2 and 2 in the Ephesian age. I know thy works. And, and thou labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil and hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars. And look here, that spirit didn't die. It's a, we got apostles and we got everything else this day and we found out when we judge them by the revelation of Jesus Christ it ain't nothing but a bunch of liars. But what was it? He said, I know thy works. Now, how about Revelations 2 and 9 in the Smyrna church age? I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but they are the synagogue of Satan. Well, we've got the same thing today. We've got a people, a bunch of people that's claiming to be, to be believers, and they're not the synagogue of Satan. They're the church of Satan. And he preaches to them continually. What does he preach to them? Antichrist doctrine, something against Christ. And all this is, everybody's working, working, working. And now in Revelations 2.13 in the Pergamos church age, I know thy works and where thou dwellest and even where Satan's seed is and thou holdest fast my name and has not denied my faith. Even in those days wherein Antipas, my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. Slain among you where Satan dwelleth. But what was it? He said, I know the works. After the church ages rest, because church ages is all about works. Okay, let's go to Thyatira. Revelations 2.19 I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and last to be more than the first. Remember, that's over there in, in thy tower, the dark ages. But they had works. And now let's go to Sardis. Revelations 3 and 1. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, and thou hast a name that thou livest and are dead. Well, there's people that's in that same condition today. They think they got it, and all the thing they got is just some kind of a makeup. It's a figment of their imagination. But what was it? Sardis had works. Every one of these ages we talked about so far has had their works. And now, how about Philadelphia? Revelations 3 and 8. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. When Philadelphia didn't go in. <clears throat> Philadelphia didn't get into this open door. And no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word and hast not denied my name. Yeah, evidently they had the name of Jesus Christ. They didn't give it up for Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, the titles. But they had a, they had a work. Now, let's come down to Laodicea. Revelation 3.15, the last church age the seventh and final church age. I know thy works. 
Well, he knew. Look here. He was writing this before the church ages ever come on the scene. But he said, I know them because I'm the omniscient God. I know all things. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou work cold or hot. But if you go on. He said, because you're not, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. Now, so we come through all of these church ages, every one of them, <clears throat> They had works and works and works and works and works. But now, after the church age, we don't, we don't find no more about works. Something happens. Because you go into a rest. You, well, we found out who the rest is. Come unto me. And I will give you rest. Not if you work your way into me, I'll help you out. And see, it takes it all away from us and puts it all on Christ. And some people, well, you know, I need to have. No, you don't. You need to accept Jesus Christ, the Word, for the day and the hour you live in. That's all you need to do. But now, so after this here, after all these works, there's a people that's going to get a rest because they have come unto Christ. They have recognized Christ. Let me put it like They have recognized the presence of Christ. That He come just like He said He would. Now, I got to go into the, the Revelation series because this is where Brother Brown, he really went in to the book of Revelation up in here, these first few chapters. Matter of fact, he come in here and he, he wrote all about that. He explained the church ages to it and all this other stuff. Well, well, we'll read it in just a minute. So I want to go to the Patmos vision in the church age book. And this is chapter two. This is page 46. Now, let's read here. Let's see what the Bible teaches us about a Sabbath rest. For he that is entered into his rest, this entering is not only the entering in, but remaining in. So when you get in this rest, you don't come and go out like they did back yonder. No, you come in and you stay, and it is an eternal rest, of which the seventh day... Is but a type. You know, there's still people holding on to the seventh day and they calling that the seal of God. Well, I'm sorry, but they are in a delusion. Thus, we see why God could not give us any one certain day of the week as a Sabbath rest. We've entered into and do remain in our rest, which Israel could not do and they did not do. We just read that. And having only a shadow of the true substance. So they just had a shadow of something that was really true, which we enjoy. So they had the shadow. We got the real thing. Now, and listen to this. This is just this is so simple. It goes, poosh, blows your mind. Why? Why go back to the shadow when we have reality now? Amen. And you could ask that. Could, why would you want to go back to it? And I ask that question all the time. I asked somebody just the other day. I put on something about it was bread and wine until he come over there in 1 Corinthians 11. He said, this do until he come. Talking about Having the communion, what they call the communion, is at the Lord's Supper, the bread and wine. But Brother Brown said, look here, don't let that symbol get you down. You have got to eat Christ. And what do the people do? They think if they eat that little piece of bread and drink that wine, well, glory to God, I am. Well, that's a work. That's something you can do. If, the, if you can do one thing 
to aid Christ in your salvation, Christ never would have had to come and die. There ain't nothing you can do to merit it. Hmm. Now, so, but what do they do? They hold on to the shadow. Look here, we've got Christ the Word that we eat, we partake of this day, the full seven court meal of the seven seals, the whole mystery of God. And the people say, well, we're waiting for this, and we're waiting, well, well, wait on. But look here, we're eating Christ. We don't want, the symbol is not going to save you. Christ is what saves you. So, why? Why would you go back to a shadow when you have the reality now? Now, if somebody asked me the question, well, did Brother Bramlin take communion? And I wrote back, I said, yes, he certainly did. He, he not only took it, he preached a message on it in 1965. And I said, if he would have told you not to take it, there wouldn't have been a revelation there. It comes by revelation. He does it in a way that you can't understand. So the only way you get it is by revelation. That is his choice. Then they ask, well, well, why Brother Branham said this? And why Brother Branham said this? Well, it seems to be contrary to what he said over here. Look here, there ain't nothing contrary in the Bible. The people, the, the Trinitarians, they hold on to Matthew 28, 19, and we come over here and we say Acts 2, 38, and we say they are the same. And they said, oh, no, no, I'll take what Jesus said. When Peter was doing exactly what Jesus said, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and it, the name is the Lord Jesus Christ. But they, they'll never see that. Why? It takes a revelation to see that. Hmm. So we don't want no shadow when we got the real thing here. But a lot of people do. Now listen to this. Remember, the Revelation series was in 1960 and 1961 before the church ages was finished in 1963. And people say, oh, the church ages, they were never finished. Well, if you want to believe that, go ahead. But I've got a whole page of quotes that says that it was finished. So, so, <clears throat> he's given this view of the book of Revelation here and he's telling us what has happened and what will happen because he goes to talking about the coming of the Lord. Well, the coming of the Lord didn't happen in 1960 or 1961 or 1962. It happened in 1963. And the people say, oh, that's the greatest. Well, it don't make no difference to me. If, look here, if God don't reveal it, you'll never get it. That's just as simple as I know how to make it. And look here, we're going to read later on. He said the book of Revelation is, is only for believers. And so that's where we're at. Now, so, <clears throat> after, before the church age were finished in 1963, when Christ came and took the book in Revelation 5, remember Revelation 5, Christ came on the scene and took the book out of the hand of him that sat on the throne. And when he did, he loosed the seals and so on. And he claimed his people because it was a book of redemption and all that he had redeemed was in the book. So, now he is speaking of what will happen after the church ages. All right, so let's see. Now, listen to this. John was seeing visions, and the visions had to be interpreted. And Brother Brown said, the vision has to be interpreted. Remember the vision that Peter had. He got up there, and he fell into a trance, and he saw, he saw this 
this four cornered sheet coming down with all of these these different animals and and they were unclean. And he said, Lord, he said, I, I'm I'm never he said, Don't call unclean what I've cleaned. And the vision was interpreted. It had to be in it wasn't about him going on a hunting trip. And it, now all of a sudden, the men from Cornelius' house come here and say, Peter, we want you to come with us. And Handy did, went over there and started to tell them about Christ. And the Holy Ghost fell on them. On the Gentiles, what they thought was a bunch of unclean heathens. So the vision has to be interpreted. Well, that's why Brother Branham was here to interpret John's visions. Nobody else could do it. I don't care how slick, how smart, how many members they got in their congregation or anything else. And then they tell me that, well, you know, Brother Brown, I mean, he, he missed it here. He didn't miss nothing. What it is, you missed it. You missed it bad when you put yourself above the prophet. Mm, man. So... John was seeing these visions, and the visions had to be interpreted, and this is where Brother Brown comes on the scene, because he took the book of Revelation, and he run through that thing. And then he told us, look here, the book of Revelation is a book of symbols. Well, <clears throat> if God give the symbols, who can, who can give the interpretation of the symbols? Now, so, we want to start here, in 1961, the Revelation, in the Revelation series, chapter 4, part 2. Now listen. Now, we find that after these things, after meant that after the church ages had ceased, because we're going to have a rest after the church ages. <clears throat> Then John was summoned to come up higher. Come up hither, which means come up here. Hither, I looked it up. Hither means here. And he showed him all that was going to happen in the world of the church age. Then after the church age was over, we find that John was a type of every true believer. Did you hear that? If you like types and shadows, you should love this one because John was a type of every true believer that will be summoned by Christ on high. Glory to God. Amen? Take that type and hold on to it. That's right. Summons come up hither. And we find out that the voice that spoke to him was the voice of a trumpet, clear, distinctly, and it was the same voice that spoke to him on earth. See, as long as he was in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, he was speaking to or from, oh, I like that, speaking from the candlesticks, see? He was in the candlesticks, candlesticks speaking from them to his church. Then... When the church age had ceased, he left the earth, moved up into the heavens, and he called his redeemed with him. Amen. He left the earth. Now, this is John because John, now he's going up. But you know, you think, well, John, he just flew away. No, John never left the Isle of Patmos. Well, where did he go? John was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Oh, you mean that was the Lord's day? Yes. Well, he was our type and we're in the Lord's day. Why? Because the Lord was with him. He was in the presence of God. Woo! Yes. Amen. So, John was that type of ever true believer. And when the church age had ceased, he moved up into the heavens and called his redeemed up with him. Oh, isn't that beautiful? Glory to God. It is because I'm part of that. I went up just like John went up. 
Look here. John went up in a vision and we had went up the same. Well, you you going to tell me John didn't go up? He went somewhere. He seen all these things and he come back and wrote them down. Now, let's go a little further here. Now, this is in the Revelations uh, chapter 4, part 1. This is 1960. Still in the Revelation series because it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what these series was all about. Now, listen to this. He said, oh, and notice, John being taken up immediately after the church age. It didn't take him. 50 years or 75 years it said John being taken up immediately after the church age was a type uh oh there's another type of the raptured church if you want to get on a whole type hold that one then comes the rapture so as soon as the church age is over, boom, there's a rapture because he told him to come up. So immediately after the church age is over, this Laodicean church age, so he points right where he's talking about. After this layout of sin, then comes the rapture. The church goes up like John did. Now listen, because everybody keeps that. Well, if you're raptured, where are you at? John was raptured up into the presence of God. And so when you get raptured, you're into the presence of God. Look here. I was in there praying this morning and I, I bowed my head and I realized that I was in the presence of God. I was talking to Almighty God. And it wasn't some long distance call because why? He's living and dwelling in me. And everybody can't say that. Now, so... The church goes up like John into the presence of God. He said, my, that just winds around my soul. Caught up at the rapture of the church. The book of Revelation was written at the end of the church age. And now, you know why people don't know nothing about the presence of God? Because Brother Brown preached two messages I know of. One of them was the presence of God unrecognized. He preached that in 1964. The presence, I mean, God come on the scene. He done everything he could do. The ministry of William Branham was ex exactly a copy of the ministry of Jesus Christ. He come on the scene. He knew the secrets of the heart. He opened blinded eyes. He healed the sick. He done everything. Raised the dead. Even, look at here, created squirrels and everything else. Called for a storm and stopped a storm and whatever more. And the people said, oh, oh. And, and all of that. And they thought, well, he's really a prophet when he's on the platform discerning and so on but when he tries to teach the word he is really off the unrecognized presence of God well how can you get into the presence when you can't even recognize it and then he preached another message a man running from the presence of God and he took that as Noah well, why, why would anybody want to run from the presence? You ought to be running to the presence. But look, look here. But if you don't even know it's here, how can you run to it? And that's where the majority of the people are today. They know nothing about the presence of God. All they know is about some church, this, that, or some creed, 
or what the pastor said or this, that, or the other. Now, so, this Laodicean, Laodicean age, then comes the rapture, the church goes up like John did into the presence of God, caught up at the rapture. Now, let's look at 1961, the Revelation chapter 4, part 3. Then we find out here, after these things, and he's done told us what, what that meant, after the church ages. And if you want to read that, you can go over there where he took his thought from was Revelation 1, chapter 1, verse 19. He said, these things hereafter. So he said, now, after these things, he heard a voice that was speaking to him. Oh, what was it? The Spirit had left the earth. After these things starts out in the first chapter over there in the first verse. And after this, I looked and behold, a door was open in heaven. Revelations 4 and 1, after the church was gone. After the church was gone. After the church was gone and there was a door and we went and we all went through all of that and found out that Christ was the door. Hmm. So you went through the door and now we found out that Christ was the door up into the presence of God. And that same voice that was walking in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks also was the same voice he heard in heaven said, Come up hither. John went up. Now listen, John went up. It represented the church going in the rapture. Oh, where is the rapture? Where is the rapture? Well, what kind of rapture? You know what the people would call the rapture? They think the rapture is this natural body flying off in the sky. Can you imagine people this day? In 2022, after all the teaching of the church and, and the revelation of Jesus Christ, and they think this flesh body is going to fly off in the air somewhere? Well, where could it go? Just up in the air? Look here. I mean, you're talking about missing the whole thing. But they do it, and you can't tell them no. They think they're going to take this body. They think that they're going. God's going to go out to the graveyard and dig up when they're with it. He said, "And the dead in Christ shall raise first. They think that God's going to go out to the graveyard and dig up that old body and do a hocus pocus on it and make it into eternal. How silly is that? When that body had a time that it began. Matter of fact, it come out of the earth and the earth had a time that it began. How can it be eternal? It is not possible. If we use the right definition, but no, no, no. You can't tell them. Just let them go ahead. But look at here. John was in the spirit. He was caught up in the presence of God. He heard something. He heard a voice. And what was the voice? It was Christ. Hmm. We've heard the voice this day. And the days of the sounding of the voice of the seventh angel when he shall begin to sound. That was the voice of Christ. Because it was a word. But no, no, no. He was, oh, he was just a church age messenger. He was just a prophet. Yeah, and God put on the prophet's mask and come down here and had a ministry. That's what it was, but they can't handle that. So, if you, can, if you can't handle that, you, know, you just don't have a clue what God is, has done and is doing. And that's where we find a lot of people this day. So, now, John went up. Now remember, John went up. It represented the church going in the rapture. 
and he was taken up when? Immediately after the church age. He didn't have to wait 50 years or 100 or whatever. Now, <clears throat> John went up in the spirit. His body never left the Isle of Patmos. Was took away into heaven and foresaw things that God promised and said to the disciples, What is it to you if he tarries till I come? He saw the coming of the Lord and what would take place. He saw on earth what would take place on earth to the rapture of the church and was taken up and shown plumb down to a past the millennium. Oh, isn't that wonderful? John, our type. Yes, it is one more if when you can see it. It's either uh, <clears throat> one or the other. Now, John was transmitted over into the Lord's day. And Brother Brown, when he was preaching, he said, Oh, this is, because it was, this was 1916. He said, Oh, this is the Lord, this is man's day. Though man this, man that, man, man, man. But he said, The day of the Lord is coming. And that happened in 1963. When the Lord come with his day. Now, let's go over. Remember, after the church ages, you get a rest. No more work. That's rest. Praise God. Now, the breach between the seven church ages and the seven seals. Now, we're going to turn to Revelation. To, we're going to turn to chapter five, and he's talking about Revelation chapter five. And you know what happened there? The book was taken. Now, this is not the seven seals. It is the breach between the church ages and the seals. Now, <clears throat> there is also a sixth chapter, but there was a fourth chapter, rather, of Revelation. And in that kind of reveal something that would take place after the church going up. Well, what did that reveal? We just read it. John went up. It was the type of the church going up. It was the rapture. And he said the church goes up on the third chapter of Revelation and does not return until the 19th chapter of Revelation. Therefore, the church misses the tribulation. I know that's contrary to pretty much every teacher I ever talked to, but I don't mean to be disagreeable, but I mean to, as your brother, I must teach as I see it. If I don't, I can't put it together, you see. Now, whether it goes up or not in the tribulation or after, I want to go up with it. That's the main thing. So, did you catch what he said? He said the church goes up on the third chapter of Revelation, coming right down to the seven church ages, and boom, it's over. The next thing come up hither. And it goes up and does not return until the 19th chapter of Revelations. Well, you know what that is. The king of kings coming on the white horses and the armies of heaven following him. And that's where we are now. We went up and we come back. And they never, they never even missed us because they don't know anything about the presence of the Lord. I mean, Jesus was walking around they didn't know that that was God walking around among them. They had not even a clue. They thought he was a nut. They thought he was a wild man, a crazy man. Uh -huh. Now, let's go a little further. This is in the fifth seal there in Jeffersonville. The reason that he reveals, as I understand, that is because the mystery of the book of redemption as far as the Antichrist being revealed. And at the same time, the church is gone, and these things don't even happen in the church age at all. Now, he's talking about this is the fifth seal, and then the Jews under crying, How long, Lord, how long do you not avenge us? 
Yeah, well, the church had been gone. They wasn't over there crying. That was the Jews. So the church had already been gone, and here he's over here dealing with the Jews now because the church goes up at the third chapter and don't come back to the 19th, and all this is happening to the Jews in there. And that, that's right, and they're away from the church age. The church is absolutely raptured at this time. So you go over there and read the fifth seal, the one that's going on, and he said, when you're reading that, the church has already been raptured. And some of these people, they're no doubt looking for that to happen. The church goes up in the fourth chapter of Revelation and does not return until it comes back with its king in Revelations, the 19th chapter. So, you got to go up. And if you go up, you come back. But, if you don't go up, you don't get to come back. You just hear. And you know what's going on here. Now, follow this up. But these seals, now listen, but these seals are revealing what has been. So the, the seals are not review, re, revealing the future. The, re, the seals are revealing what has been in the church age. And during that time, it was, he said, what was the seven seals? It was the mysteries in the church age. And what it is and what will be. And now what was to be for the church age was revealed by these seals. Did you catch that? And now watch what takes place. Now, here in the first seal, remember, after church ages rest, after church ages rest, Christ. First, <clears throat> first seal. Now, those first three books is the first seven church ages. And then we find out in the fourth chapter of Revelation, John is caught up. And we see the other churches, and there's not too much said about the church ages. That's where I think the people are going to be surprised. They're applying the church way over in, into the tribulation to those things that's a happened. So they're applying these things over here and these things have already happened. Now, somebody said the other day, said, said could you imagine anything worse going to happen to the Jews than it's already happened? when they rounded them up, put them on cattle cars, put them in train cars, hauled them off to camps, they gassed them, they shot them, they starved them, six million they know about, not counting all the ones they don't know. And the world just stood by and said, well, whatever. So can you imagine something? Well, there's only, there's only about six million in the whole nation of Israel right now. So they'd have to kill off the whole nation. And people were, well, we were, we were watching the Jews over there. The Jews' time, when those seals opened up, it was Daniel's 70th, the last part of the 70th week. That's what was promised to them. Well, if Christ come the first part, of the 70th week and preached three and a half years and he come in the second half and preached three and a half years, it is over. But no, they're waiting. Some guy told me, well, we're waiting for the red heifer. I said, what? You're waiting for the red heifer? Because they got to have this red heifer to, to sacrifice. It can't even have a, a one hair that's not red. Why is it red? Because it's red, it's blood, and the red heifer was Jesus Christ, and His blood paid the price. 
I don't care if you got 10,000 red heifers. It won't do one bit of good. That ain't no good no longer. People are, whoo, people's minds are so muddled up with church in old time, holding on to shadows and everything else. And Christ is here revealing himself. But no, well, Jesus couldn't turn them around. Did he turn them around? No, he couldn't turn them around. He they, they said, we're getting rid of that nut. We'll get him crucified. And they did. But the only thing about it, they crucified him. And he come back 10,000 times 10,000 strong. Because that released the very life of God into the body. And it's working today. Now, Whew, my goodness, that was good. Praise the Lord. Whew. Now, <clears throat> so they're going to be surprised. And <laughs> boy, they're surprised today. But, you know, you surprise them, they say, uh, nothing to that. This guy's a false prophet. He don't know what he's talking about. Well, I'm reading from one that does know because that was his commission and mission to the earth. So, they're applying the church way over here in the tribulation to those things that uh, a happened. And as I said last night, the first thing you know, those tribulations will break in and yonder. Why? The first coming was the rapture. And it'll be as it has, has been and it's past and you didn't know it. And that's where they are today. And you quote that to them and they say, Psh, nothing to it. We're waiting for the rapture. Yeah. But what was it? It's past and they didn't know it. It's past the day and they don't know it. They're looking for the shoes to be dropped off while they're flying through the air in this natural body. See? Now, there's not too much promise to that church, the Gentile church, the bride. Now, let's go. We're going over to the Feast of the Trumpets. Now, listen. He just, and this one little quote, he lays it out. Boy, I tell you what. <clears throat> people say, whoa, this is so deep. But here, in one paragraph, whoosh, boom, boom, it's over. Now, Feast of the Trumpets here in Jeffersonville, 1964. Now, I begin to notice that the preaching of the seven church ages, which is the pattern or the forecast of all that God was going to do for the churches. So what are they going to do for the church? It's going to be in the church age. And after the church ages, we can rest. Praise God. So, and through the churches and positionally setting them up. The first three chapters of the book of Revelation reveals all the happenings unto the church. So if you want to see what's going to happen, let's go back over there and read it. Happens. Then from the third chapter unto the 19th chapter of Revelation, there is no more seen of the church. The church goes up at the fourth chapter of Revelation and returns back at the 19th chapter of Revelation, the bride and the groom together. Well, something happened. There was a marriage. The bride has made herself ready. Aha. Uh -huh. Invisible union of the bride of Christ, the unrecognized presence of God. I mean, he's here and we married him and the world knew nothing about it. Amen. Bride and groom together. Coming to the earth. We're what? We're coming back to the earth. What? We got a job to do. Look here, we're going, we're going, we're going, woo, we're fixing to get in some hot. And then from the 19th, I told you, this is a, a, a little capsule of all these things. And then from the 19th chapter to the 22nd chapter, it's all on the millennium and what will be in the years that is to follow. 
during the 4th to the 19th. Now listen, during from the 4th to the 19th, God is dealing with Israel. Why was he dealing? Because the church is gone. The church has been took up, caught up, raptured. He's dealing. Well, they look here. They don't know nothing. They don't know because they won't pay no attention. You can't tell them nothing. So, let's go into the rapture book. Now, the book of Revelation is the last book of the Bible. It's sealed to unbelievers. Sealed to them. And that's why there's so much confusion with them. Because it's sealed to them and they read it as a natural as a natural thing. And they can get, well, you know, this this really this really don't fit. But it don't make no difference to them. Oh, it, it said it. Uh, 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 it's a symbol, but you know. No, I don't know. The symbol has to be interpreted just like the vision has to be interpreted. And there's only one can do it, and that is the prophet. And he's done that. He's told us these things, but not to them. No, no, no. Look here, if you don't take the whole message, you're in trouble. If you try to hop and skip and jump over here and say, well, he was over here, but he wasn't over here. When he, when he said this, he was in the flesh. He said, oh, no, no, it won't work. It's just like trying to hop and skip around the Bible. Look here, the Bible is the Word of God from Genesis over to Revelation. And every little word in there is in there for a purpose. Hmm. But they don't know that. Now, so from the fourth chapter of Revelation to the 19th, he's dealing with the Jews because what? The church has gone up. Now, the rapture says this book, the revelation has sealed to the unbeliever. And here in the Bible, in the 22nd chapter, whosoever shall take one word from it or add one word to it will take his part out of the book of life. We realize that. And it was altogether given. Now listen, it was all to give. This book of Revelation was altogether given for believers. And it opens the book of Revelation and reveals who the author of this entire book is. He is to look upon as Alpha and Omega from Genesis to Revelation. Jesus Christ, just the same, right straight through and reveals the complete mystery of himself and his plan. For his church ages, that's to come and, and was sealed in there by seven seals. Okay, they were sealed, but the seals have been revealed. So there, there's no reason we shouldn't know because the prophet come. That was his that was his whole ministry was the mystery of God to reveal the mysteries that they didn't have time during the church ages. And he come and he done a marvelous job at it. And that's why people can't wait there. Well, you know, uh, these these seals they kind of sound like the church ages, yeah, because it was the church ages plus because he told you what was the mysteries that wasn't revealed during the church ages. The whole thing is out now. It's been plain view. Now, <clears throat> let's look over here to the second seal there in Jeffersonville, 1963. Now, he said, let's go over just a minute to Revelations. We'll see now if I'm not just saying that or whatever the Word says. In Revelations 19.11, I saw heaven open, amen, and behold a white horse, and he that sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness did he judge and make war. His eyes were the flame of fire, and in his hand, and on his head many crowns. Oh, brother, see, he's done been crowned by his saints. Well, how could he be crowned by the saints if they wasn't up there with him? They went up in the fourth chapter. 
and didn't return till the 19th chapter. But now he's coming back. He's been crowned by the saints. You see? And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And remember, he said he had been crowned. Not he's going to be crowned. He's been crowned. So it's already happened. When he's coming back, he's got on this crown. Now, crowned by a saint. And let's see. And we don't know. And he was clothed. Let's see. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called, not is, but called the Word of God. For he and the Word is the same. Come unto me. Not the man. Come unto me, the word, he and his word, is the same. Notice, not his name, his name, called the word of God. He only knows one name, no other name, and the armies of heaven, which were in heaven, followed him upon white horses. And look here. He was on a white horse. And we're on white horses because his armies that were with him. And that's a symbol. And Brother Brown told us the white horse is the word. So he's coming back riding on the word. We're coming back riding on the Word because He is the Word. We are the Word. It's all about the Word. Praise God. And these people think, well, unrecognized presence of God. That's all it is. They can't. Look here. How could a blind, how could a blind man recognize my presence? If I'd holler, he might could see me, but he sure can't see me with his eyes. And that's what this whole Laodicea is. It's blind and naked and wretched and, and don't even know it. And they're trying to tell us something and knoweth it not. Yeah. Pitiful, pitiful, pitiful. Okay, now let's see. And so he was dipped in his name and he was clothed. And fine linen, white and clean, that's the righteousness of the saints. Look here. But that's what the, 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 the bride, the wife wears. Because it is, that white is righteousness. That white is eternal life. That white is the Word. That white horse is the, it's all about Christ and His Word. But look here. They don't know that. Because why? It's the unrecognized present. They don't know he's here. They're waiting for him to come. They think, well, one day he'll come. Just like the Jews, they said, well, this is not our Messiah. We ain't having that old Messiah. But that ain't the one we're looking for. So they've done away with him. And what happened? They, for the last 2,000 years, they've been looking for Messiah. And they're not going to get one. The only one that gets one was 144,000. They recognized Christ the Word because he come back for them. Because he'd already got the church. Remember, we were gone from the fourth to ninth, and he's dealing with Israel. Well, he had to run them out of Europe to put them back in Palestine. When he got them in Palestine, he got them all set up. He made them a nation again. And then he comes on the scene and reveals himself just like he did before. They said, Glory to God, that's the Messiah. Huh. But you think the Wall Street Jew knew anything about it? You think the politician Jews knew anything about it? No, it, the only one knew anything about it was the predestinated, just like the only one that knew anything about His coming is the predestinated sons and daughters of God that are part of Him. I don't care what He could do. The world could never see it. He said, the world won't see me no more, and He wasn't cracking a joke. When he said they won't see him, they won't see him. They didn't even see him the first time. Look here, they looked at him and looked right through him and said, who is this poor little old man? Uh, walking around with this bunch of vagabonds. Pretty much the same thing today, if you got the truth. Now, let's see, where are we? Okay, the fourth seal, Jeffersonville. Now remember in Revelations 19, 
not only is he getting ready, and he's talking about, look here, we're going to have a fight down here. There's going to be a battle raging, and it's going on, and most people don't even know it. Not only is, is he getting ready, but Christ is getting ready to meet him. Who's he going to meet? The Antichrist. It's Christ, the Word, against the Anti-Word. That's, that's what it's always been. Now, and only is he getting ready, but Christ is getting ready. The battle's going to be hot and heavy. So this ain't going to be some picnic. This is going to be the real deal here. Christ in Revelation 19, Christ is gathering his, not from the four corners of the earth, because they're going to be a little bitty remnant. What's he doing? He's gathering them from the four corners of heaven. We'll get them souls under the altar. You'll see whether or not four corners of heaven on a snow white horse, and he has a name, not death, like old Antichrist riding a death horse. He's got a name, not death, but the Word of God life. Amen? Got it wrote on his side here. The Word of God. That's the only life because God is the only source of eternal life. There is Zoe. So, I don't care what that guy's. Yeah, he's got the, the, the right thing on him. The eagle... You know, he was white horse, red horse, black horse. He never had a name until the eagle come on the scene, the prophet, and give him a name. And what did he call him? Death, eternal separation from God. So ride on with your Antichrist bunch. And the same thing that's on him is on you. Death. While we're over here, riding on the white horse of life, eternal life. Remember, it never had a beginning and it never has an end. It can never go away, no matter what happens. Now, let's see. Still in this feast of the trumpets here. Now, now while that group is arriving, one group, the Antichrist group, making themselves ready to stomp out everything that won't agree with them, and they're trying to do it. <laughs> Stomping and a carrying and a fussing and a fuming and woo but it don't make no difference. It was right in making them ready to stomp out everything that won't agree with them. And there is another group being made ready after a while. Revelation 19, we done read about it. That's him coming on the white horse. And the next time the church is heard, she comes not exactly horses, but the Bible said he was on a white horse and the host of heaven followed him upon white horses. Is that right? While this group is down here, got 2,000 bound at the, the river Euphrates, and has been bound for 2,000 years. Also, that church has been bound, has bound the Holy Ghost for nearly 2,000 years under martyrdom, down back in the church ages, and there under the church ages has been bound not at the river Euphrates, but at the door of creeds and denominations. And let me say this, if you're still bound up with your creeds and your dogmas and your denominations, you're still bound. That the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit can't work in the church because of man-made system, but she's going to be liberated. She's coming back. And that's what the Bible says. And those two meet again on the battleground, Lucifer and Michael, and Michael is Christ. And again, like in the den, they've been bound for 2,000 years, but they're going to meet again. And Christ is victorious. Look here. If you want to read it, to go back to the back of the book. We're victorious. This is all just part of God's plan here. You say, well, why did he do that? Well, maybe when we get up there, we'll just talk about it a while. Say, why was this done like this? And he'll probably say, because I wanted it to be. Amen. So, 
What difference does it make? So she's coming back. And there's going to be on the battlegrounds Lucifer and Michael again in, like in the beginning. So look here. It starts off in the beginning up in heaven. Lucifer and Michael. And then it comes down here on earth. And it is again Lucifer and Michael, Christ, doing the battle. Well, who won the battle in the beginning? Christ didn't get kicked out. He got kicked out. Well, who do you think is going to win the battle in the end? Now, i got one last thing I'm going to say here. And this is Brother Brown of your question and answers, 1964. This is number one. He said, now, He's talking about Peter. He said, Not so, Lord. Nothing's ever come into my mouth unclean. See? See? There's a vision. Now watch. It has to be interpreted. So the prophet tells us that a vision has to be interpreted. And glory to God. He took John's visions and he has interpreted them because that was what he was supposed to do. And after the church ages... And the church ages is done and over. And I don't care. If, if you want to stay and lay on the sea, go ahead. That just means you never got took up. You never got caught up. You didn't hear the call come up hither. So stay over there. You and the Antichrist and all the blind people stay over there in darkness while we're over here in the marvelous light Christ and his wife and she is him and so the battle he said the battle is going hot and heavy it is right now and it's between Christ the word and the antichrist and it looks like well you know uh, the antichrist looks like no 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 God's always in the minority but me and God is in the majority so that's just how simple it is. So, praise God. Look here. And he, I didn't read it, but I can read it. He said, the millennium is the rest day. If you want a rest day, that's the millennium. Well, when Christ comes back, look here, we was coming back for that. He said, from the 19th on was on the millennium. Well, we've come back. But no, no, no. They've got well, they got a natural one. They got a literal thousand years. They're gonna turn it into natural. Let's let them go ahead. You can't turn them around. But Christ and his bride are on this earth, and he has set up his kingdom. The king has come. And it is an eternal kingdom with an eternal people with eternal joy, eternal, eternal. Nothing temporal about this. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you again today. Lord, we're so glad that we that we heard the call come up hither. And Lord, we could enter into that eternal rest. Lord, you provided it and we have accepted it. And Lord, there's nothing can take us out of this rest. Lord, how happy, how glad we are to be in that number. Lord, in that number clothed in white. That we were riding on our word, Lord. And we're riding this morning. And the world can't see it. They can't accept it. It's only the predestinated that gets this, Lord. So we thank you for that. We give you praise and we love you this morning. In Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Praise.